Okay, for the first view, we have our parasternal long axis view, which can be obtained from third to fifth intercoastal space at 11 o'clock position index marker. Now we move to the RV inflow, which is also at the parasternal long axis view, and it's still the same o'clock position at 11, but you tilt inferiorly and angulate medially. Back to the parasternal long axis view. As you can see, we can identify the structures, the, the, the aortic valve, mitral valve, LV, RV, and LA. Right now, we are measuring the aortic root. Next is the sinus of Valsalva. Then we go on to the sinotubular junction sinotubular junction. And then the proximal ascending aorta. Back to the first one, the aortic root, you measure at the aortic annulus where the leaflets meet the vessel. Now we go to the short axis. As you can see, it is at the 2 o'clock position, still at the same position at the third intercoastal space the same as the parasternal long axis. You just rotate the probe for, it to, for the index marker to go to the 2 o'clock position. We then proceed to measuring the aortic diameter and the diameter of your main pulmonary artery. For measuring the main pulmonary artery, be sure to measure below the pulmonic valve. Okay, now we proceed back to the short axis as we do our sweep. We do this by tilting inferiorly. We are now at the level of the base or the mitral valve. Tilting further, we go to the level of the papillary muscles. And when you tilt some more, it's at the level of the apex, where the papillary muscles disappear. We are now leaving the parasternal long axis and then proceeding to the apical views. Initially, we do the apical four chamber view where the index marker is at the three o'clock position. We can see all the four chamber, all the four chamber structures, such as the left ventricle at your upper right, and your right ventricle at your upper left, and then below them, correspondingly, is your left atrium and right atrium. We then proceed to measuring the left atrial diameter, or right atrial diameter rather and then your left atrial diameter. This is measured at the end of the T wave. Next, we are going to try to measure your left ventricle using the Simpsons method. We do this by first zooming in on the left ventricle to be able to discern the walls the endocardium and the myocardium. As you can see, it is the thickening of the inner wall that we are interested in to be able to accurately determine the volume that the left ventricle can hold in as its maximum and minimum capacity. First, we measure at the onset of QRS, which is diastole. Using the Simpsons method, we trace the inner wall of your left ventricle, carefully avoiding the papillary muscles, not including the papillary muscles. Next, we move over to the systole, or the point where your left ventricle is at its maximum contraction, 
and measure the inner wall again. We use the same method, Simpsons, and we also avoid the papillary muscle. We do not include that in the measurement. After that, we then proceed to try and measure the left atrial volume. For this example, we're going to use the same method, which is the Simpsons method, as it also determines, or through Simpsons method, we can determine the length, the width, and the diameter, as well as the volume of your left atrium. We do that by zooming in again. At the end of the T wave, or systole rather, we, we employ the Simpsons method. Carefully trace the left atrial diameter. And then we're done. Next, we proceed to the five chamber, which is also at the three o'clock position at the apical, at the point of maximum impulse at the apex. We just do this by tilting the probe superiorly. For the apical two chamber, at the same point, we rotate the probe to the 12 o'clock position. And then, just as we did at the four chamber view, we will try and measure the left ventricle capacity volume using the same method, the Simpsons method. Okay. Using the Simpsons method, we are going to try and and avoid the the papillary muscles as well as the other trabeculations, measuring the inner wall of your left ventricle. And there we have it. Next, we move on to systole, which is the part where the left ventricle is at its maximum contraction and minimum capacity volume. Still using the same method, Simpsons, avoiding the trabeculations and measuring the inner wall. We now unfreeze and return to the two chamber view as you can only see the left atrium and left ventricle. Now we will try and proceed to measure the left atrial volume using the Simpsons method again as it provides a lot of information as compared to the other measuring methods. Just a reminder, it is at the end of the T wave. Okay, now we proceed to the apical three chamber, which is a, a short variation from the apical two chamber by rotating it furthermore counterclockwise to the 11 o'clock position. For a subcostal view, prepare the patient by allowing them to lie supine with the knees bent to alleviate any pressure at the subcostal area. It is the subcostal view at the three o'clock position at your sub siphoid process, pointing it pointing the probe upward and towards the left of the chest, you can see a four-chamber view of the heart. This is where we try and assess if there are atrial de septal defects or ventricular septal defects. If you angulate your probe towards the middle of the sternum, you can see the superior vena cava directly entering the, the right atrium. Above it is your hepatic vein, 
which goes through your liver. For the suprasternal view, place the pillow at the level of the patient's shoulders, allowing the neck to extend, revealing the suprasternal notch, where you will be putting the probe. Moving your index marker for your probe at the 1 o'clock position, you can then see the ascending, or descending aorta rather, and the branches of the left of the aorta, which are the left common carotids and the left subclavian. And that concludes our first session for views. Have a good day.